Okay, so timing, as we transition into um, timing and half-life and dosing interval, um, you guys know this as well as I do, but I'm just going to pull these two scenarios up so that you can look at the plots. So the first plot on the left is when we have a dose, a drug whose half-life is very short compared to the dosing interval. So this would be, for example, um, levetiracetam. And the working half-life I use for levetiracetam in both dogs and cats is about four hours. And it's a good example of why eight hours is probably the longest dosing interval you can use for some patients. So in this scenario, we never really reach steady state because the drug concentrations are fluctuating. And the amount of the concentration, I'm sorry, the amount of fluctuation, that is the amount of drug that's eliminated between each dose, depends upon the relationship between the half-life and the dosing interval. So in this case, we're going to have a very high Cmax compared to the C-min. And while for some drugs that might be okay, let's say the aminoglycosides, where really we want that C-min to be really low and we want the C-max to be pretty high, I don't think that's a good thing for anti-seizure meds. I don't think it's a good thing for drugs that act reversibly. And this would probably be to some degree most of our immune modulators as well. So in this scenario, the response is going to need to be to shorten the dosing interval if our patient hasn't responded. The problem with timing of samples here, and again, the patient doesn't really get to steady state. Um, on the one hand, that's good because we can assess the concentrations and the dose after the first dose, presumably, or certainly after the first couple of doses, plus we're going to wait for a seizure interval. But that also means that we can't get a single sample. If we do get just a C max, then it's going to massively overestimate the concentrations to which the patient is exposed during a dosing interval. If we get just a single trough, and that's what I recommend for anti-seizure meds if the client can't afford both, that might be okay for anti-seizure meds because it does tell us the lowest concentration the patient is exposed to during a dosing interval. And that's what I'm worried about for seizure meds or anti-seizure meds. But if this is a drug that's potentially toxic and that C-max is important, I can't begin to predict what the maximum drug concentration is based upon that just before the next dose trough. So whether or not you get a peak sample or a trough sample in this scenario, first of all, it depends upon the half-life, but of course it also depends upon the drug itself. I like getting peaks and troughs for the levetiracetam so I can actually calculate the half-life and tell the veterinarian, you know, it's okay, you can probably get away with an eight hour dosing interval, maybe even a 12 hour dosing interval, but we've measured half life as short as one hour. And it's clear that the drug is gonna fluctuate massively even during an eight hour dosing interval. So the other reasons I like knowing this is if you just think about responses, we've already talked about time to steady state, there is no such thing. Um, we frequently are told by clients, well, my patient, my pet was going to seizure. And so I gave Give it an extra dose. In this scenario, giving an extra dose really does make a difference because each peak and each trough is influenced by that single dose. It also tells us that, yeah, maybe the patient does seizure just before the next dose because that fluctuation can result in subtherapeutic concentrations during the dosing interval. So an example of a short half-life compared to a dosing interval. And of course, the other, uh, other end of the spectrum is a drug that has a long half-life compared to a dosing interval. And so this would be phenobarbital, zanismide, and of course, bromide is a good example. In this scenario, very little drug is eliminated during the half-life. And so um, the example I use is phenobarbital has a half-life of 48 hours. Um, it's not until you get ready to give that fifth dose that half of the drug is gone. And so this drug will accumulate until steady state is reached. So that does allow us to have this longer dosing interval. Um, it does mean that we've got to pay attention to when steady state occurs. So we're not going to want to monitor until steady state occurs, plus ideally one um, seizure episode or one seizure interval. Does mean that there's going to be a delay in response as well. Um, and so one of the things that we can do is proactively monitor at one half-life. And using bromide as an example with a 21-day half-life, patients don't get to steady state 
until about three months, one of the things the clients can do, especially if this is a cluster seizure in dog where it's really important to know, is our dose going to work? One of the things we can do is monitor it three weeks, multiply that by two, and presumably we're predicting to some degree the drug concentrations at steady state. In this scenario, um, the idea of responding or increasing response, you know, shorten the dosing interval isn't gonna do any good. It's just gonna make the client crazy. So what we'll have to do is increase the dose. Another reason, another example to think about is in this scenario, if a client does have a patient that is showing um, a um, preictal response, giving a single extra dose isn't going to make a world of difference because the amount of drug in that patient's body reflects the time to steady state. So two weeks for phenobarbital and zinismide, two months for bromide. So in that scenario, the client has to give lots of little doses. And so the idea of a loading dose becomes important when we have a drug that takes a while to get to steady state. The other thing I remind clients of is when we have a drug with a long half-life, if the client does think their patient is getting ready to seizure just before the next dose, it doesn't make a whole bunch of sense with these drugs because, again, drug concentrations simply don't fluctuate much during the dosing interval. And in this scenario, a peak and a trough really doesn't help us. A single sample really any time during the dosing interval should be okay. We encourage troughs for anti-seizure meds just because sometimes that half-life does get short. About 10% of patients on phenobarbital probably have a half-life that's less than 24 hours. And especially if we're having difficulty controlling that patient's seizures, that I'll encourage them to get both a peak and a trough so we can find out if that patient is a patient that has a short half-life. And if that indeed is the case, then maybe what we've done is we've seen that tra patient transition over to this situation where their drug concentrations are actually fluctuating during a dosing interval. So I spend a lot of time trying to explain to veterinarians this relationship between half-life, dosing interval, time to steady state versus fluctuation, how it impacts their response. Do I change interval versus dose? How it impacts when they monitor, how it impacts when they assess the patient. And I have to remind them, anytime they change the dosing regimen at all for this situation here with the long half-life, then they have to wait for a new steady state to occur. So bromide is a good example where sometimes we can't wait for steady state concentrations to occur. A patient that's uh, cluster seizuring where we want phenobarbital or even zanismide to act in the jiffy, that's where we pull up all of our neat little therapeutic drug monitoring calculations. We calculate a loading dose that's intended to get us to therapeutic concentrations immediately. But, and you know this, I'm going to remind you, you are not at steady state. You're at steady state concentrations, presumed steady state concentrations, but you won't be at steady state until you've been using that same dosing regimen for three to five half-lives. And so if your maintenance dose, which is intended to maintain what you achieve with your loading dose, does not do that the match is not good, this loading dose is gonna gradually decline. And what will happen is if your maintenance dose does not keep things at that therapeutic concentration, your patient might seizure. And when they potentially will seizure, most likely will be one half-life into that dosing, uh, that maintenance dose. And so what we've actually encouraged veterinarians to do is if they use a loading dose for bromide, get us a sample after the load, so after five days of loading, and then one half-life later, which is about three weeks. And if the two samples don't match, that allows us to proactively adjust that dose up or down because what will potentially happen is yay the patient responds with the loading dose three weeks later it starts seizuring because the drug concentrations have dropped everybody has forgotten this probably isn't therapeutic failure but might simply mean that the maintenance dose did not maintain what the loading dose achieved and all we had to do was up the dose so we get them to monitor at 
three weeks after the loading dose is complete, after they've shifted to the maintenance dose, and then again to establish baseline at steady state three months later. So um, these are just a summary of the recommendations that we make regarding monitoring. So for phenobarbital, oops, sorry, I went too fast. Uh, phenobarbital, zanismide, I kind of clump zanismide and phenobarbital together. Their therapeutic reference interval is about the same. Their half-life, once the patient's been on the drug for a while, is about the same. Um, their dosing interval is the same. And so for zanismide and phenobarbital, we generally recommend a single trough sample. If they're having difficulty controlling the patient, then yep, a peak in the trough. Um, and then we calculate a half-life form. Bromide, really any time. And then I've told you about if they're loading, then a post-load, and then one at three weeks later, and then one at three months. Otherwise, we tell them if you're not worried about that, just wait till the patient gets to steady, say any time during the dosing interval at three months. So levetiracetam is a little bit more difficult. Part of it's because we have extended release products. I think if we come back to this idea of generic, and I think that there were 15 extended release products, I think some of them actually do act as extended release in dogs and or cats. We just don't know which ones and we don't know in which species. Um, so that's a problem, but most of them act as a um, immediate release. So they have a peak and then they have a gradual consistent um, logarithmic decline uh, to trough. The problem is that the time to peak varies um, from from anywhere to two to four hours. And it can drive your client, your veterinary client crazy if you have different peak times. But in general, we've, we've recommended two hours, although we understand that the peak may not occur for four hours. And this is true for cyclosporin as well. But the difference between a two hour peak and a four hour peak, at least in the data I've seen for most of these drugs is not different enough for it to really make a big difference in the calculation of a half-life. So it's a variability that I'm willing to accept in the data just so we can get that peak and trough sample. And then what we recommend as far as when to monitor these drugs with short half-lives, and so this would be cyclosporin as well. Its half-life is about four to nine hours, would be three to five days um, uh, just to make sure that there isn't any steady state issue. So I think that we've gone through this. This is just showing you how we do recommend a major recommendations as far as um, monitoring for drugs with long half-lives. And you could do this for phenobarbital as well. A patient that comes in on status and they've given an IV administration and the patient has responded, boy, if we could get our neurologist to collect a sample right then, then we know the therapeutic range for that patient. And that helps us guide the maintenance dose for that patient as they recover from their epileptic seizure. Again, reminding ourselves that we would want to get a sample about two weeks into transitioning to that maintenance dose on phenobarbital. Um, so I think I've gone through all this. I'm just going to, here's our buddy aminoglycosides. So for aminoglycosides, one of the things I'm going to warn you about is we're after two things with aminoglycoside. We're after making sure that the peak concentration ideally is about 10 times the um, MIC of the infecting organism. And if I don't have the MIC from a culture report, then I'll look for an MIC 90 um, in the literature. But the other thing that we want for aminoglycoside is we want to make sure that that trough concentration is well below the target trough of one to two uh, micrograms per mil. The problem is if you get a peak, um, and let's assume that this is administered either intravenously or sub-Q, your peak concentration will occur at one to two hours. If you wait until just before the next dose trough and you're administering this drug once a day, which is the general recommendation, the drug will be gone if there's a three hour half-life because you know it'll be gone pretty much in nine hours. So one of the things that I've encouraged doing is instead of getting a trough, get a sample about two to three half-lives after your peak sample so that the concentration will still be detectable. Because what I wanna be able to do is calculate a half-life. If I've got those two data points, I can do that and I can tell them where the trough is going to predict out, but I've got to see detectable concentrations to be able to measure that slope and measure that peak. So we've encouraged that um, in our patients. And I think I actually have a, a case of that to show you. 
Um, so this is just reminding people about the difference between the loading dose and the, and the um, maintenance dose. And the only reason I bring this up is just to remind you that, um, that the magnitude of difference between the loading dose and maintenance dose depends upon the half-life of the drug. So for bromide, um, the maintenance dose is about 15 times the loading dose. Sorry, the loading dose is about 15 times the maintenance dose. For phenobarb, with a much shorter half-life, the loading dose is only about three to four times that maintenance dose. And then I'm just showing you again when to monitor, so we don't need to go through that again. So coming back to the idea of trying to encourage us to think about how we can use this data. This is some of the data that Tom and I and Kamal Teep are looking at now. But what we did with our therapeutic drug monitoring database, and this is older data, Tom, you've seen it. So you're coming up with much better data. But I asked the question based upon veterinarians saying, yes, my patient has responded versus not. If we pulled those patients out that are on monotherapy, and these are dogs, zanismide, 69% responders, phenobarbital, 69% responders, same with bromide, but levetiracetam, only 50%. And I think part of it's that excruciatingly short half-life. It's such a great little drug and so safe, but such a short half-life. And then we did the same thing with combination therapy and kind of the way to look at this is all sorts of combinations are being used, but those patients that responded best and the percent of responders or in parentheses are the ones that had phenobarbital, zanismide, or bromide in their combinations versus the patients that had that shorter half-life level the teracetam in their, um, in their combination. So again, this is the kind of stuff I think that we should be using this data for. So I think I've got maybe four more minutes. What I'd like to do is just show you a couple of cases. Um, one of the things I like to show veterinarians is this is our Kepra data, uh, levetiracetam data, and using the half, I use it to show veterinarians why you can't use peak samples. So if you look at the dose across the top and what the peak concentration presumably would be across the top in the second row, in one half-life, the drug concentrations will drop by 50%. So by the time four half-lives roll around, we will have lost 90% of the drug and the drug concentrations will really bottom out. So it's just an example of why, of how I try and get veterinarians to understand that eight hour dosing intervals sound real great, especially when you've got a peak concentration of 120 micrograms per mil. But by the time eight hours rolls around, you're down to subtherapeutic concentrations. Um, we do for monitoring, we do just take the simple, if the drug concentration is 10 and we want it to be 20, we double the dose. And while it is not totally accurate because drugs are eliminated logarithmically, within the therapeutic range that we're dealing with, it's primarily a linear response. And so this works for us pretty well. A proportional dose change will result in a proportional change in concentration. There are exceptions, and I alluded to this, and I don't have them on the slide, but dogs are a, don't acetylate. Zanismide is eliminated by acetylation. And I do think that there's a concentration that is achieved with zanismide in dogs, and it will differ for each dog. But as we get above 60 to 70 micrograms per mil with zanismide, we, I do see in some patients a sharp increase in drug concentrations, even with a minute change in dose. And I see that with phenobarbital in cats as we get above 39 to 40 micrograms per mil. So I think that's probably a saturation effect and it just makes tweaking dosing regimens more difficult. And the opposite happens as well. If your patient's at 70 and you go, oh my gosh, this is too high for zanismide, I want to get it down to 50. And so you drop the drug concentrations by about 20% and you expect only a 20% decrease in, I'm sorry, you drop the dose by 20% and you only expect a 20% change in drug concentrations, and it turns out to be 50%, and maybe that you've gone from that saturated zero order elimination back to first order elimination. And so there's been a disproportionate change in drug concentrations. So this is um, a, a reminder of how we calculate half-life from these patients. And so it's just a simple based upon the um, half-life, um, and I'm sorry, just based upon 
the time that's elapsed between our peak and trough concentrations and the concentration change between our two samples. So we'll calculate half-life and from that we'll actually get a KEL. And I acknowledge that if you are on this side of the slope because you have collected your sample too early rather than on this side of the plasma drug versus concentration curve, then your peak concentration may not be totally accurate, but I'm going to use this to show that it really is not going to influence that calculation very much. And once we've calculated the CEL or KEL, especially if we know that the drug was given intravenously or that the bioavailability of the drug um, given sub-Q is close to 100%, then we can actually back extrapolate to a CO, so the y-axis concentration. Then we can calculate at least a central volume, um, and then we can calculate clearance. And just to show you how we've used that um, therapeutically, um, this was a Staffordshire Terrier that had um, septicemia. And so he was given his um, amicacin uh, intravenously. We had an MIC from the organism that was cultured. We were able to back calculate based upon a peak and a trough his um, initial concentration, which we found out was going to be too low. Um, it was going to, his initial concentration was only going to be, where was it? 5.4 micrograms per mil, and we wanted it to be 10. His volume of distribution for this drug was probably pretty high because of fluid therapy. The half-life was kind of spot on. And so we actually recommended as long as he was getting fluid therapy to double his dose. Um, but then as his fluid therapy was decreased to um, actually come back and monitor again. And so we did that. And this is just showing you the calculations. And there's lots of resources for this. It's in my book. Um, it's in, I think, Dr. Uh, Revere's book. So lots of places where you can um, get these calculations.